Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Al Simpson, the director, uh, director, excuse me, director of the Institute of Politics. No, it's Peter Sellers used to do that. I can't stand that. Uh, I loved Peter Sellers. Did you all enjoy Peter Sellers? Uh, I did too. Words to live by. Is that your dog? No, it's my, my dog. Welcome to the forum. Uh, this afternoon, we gather to, uh, to discuss what most historians and most all Republicans and many Americans of the other faith, known as Democrats, uh, believe to be one of the most important presidencies of the 20th century. Joining us to discuss the legacy of Ronald Reagan is a remarkable chronicler of Ronald, of Ronald Reagan, Lou Cannon. Lou is currently a freelance writer, and his work has appeared in George, The Washington Post, The Los Angeles Times, National Review, Island Magazine, TV Guide, California Journal, where he is a contributing editor. Lou Cannon is probably the uh, one journalist, and I was there in those years, all of those years, who had the closest relationship with the former president a relationship he formed when he covered Reagan for the Washington Post, which he joined in 1972. During his time with the Post, he also served as a bureau chief and wrote a weekly syndicated column. He's the author of five books, including three on President Reagan. The latest entitled, President Reagan, The Role of a Lifetime, is the culmination of more than 25 years covering Ronald Reagan, beginning in 1965. When asked about his extensive writing on Reagan, the uh, author exclaimed that I, I was going to keep on writing about Reagan till I got it right. I don't know whether I did, but I tried, unquote. Cannon has also received much acclaim for his work and stance on the Los Angeles riots. He authored the book, quote, official negligence, how Rodney King and the riots changed Los Angeles and the LAPD, unquote. Not surprisingly, he has won many awards, including from the American Political Science Association for Distinguished Reporting of Public Affairs, the Aldo Beckman Award for Overall Excellence in Presidential Coverage, a coveted one, the Merriman Smith Award for Excellence in Deadline Reporting, the Gerald Ford Prize for Lifetime Achievement in Distinguished Reporting on the Presidency. He grew up out in the Wild West, in Nevada and California. And when asked about how he became interested in journalism, he explained, I, I'd just been interested all of my life. And when I was a kid, I remember we played football games on the farm, and I'd been seven or eight years old, and then I'd go write up a story of the game. And I've always wanted to be a reporter. I don't know why. Now this. Lou fits me, I was the sports editor of the Cody Bronk Highlights, and I too was playing on the team at that time. And you can imagine the objective reporting as I describe my prowess on the field of play. And Cannon, Lou and his wife, Lou Cannon and his wife Mary live in Summerlin, California. Lou is the father of four, including Carl Cannon of the National Journal, six grandchildren, it is a great honor and pleasure to introduce to you this man who I've watched chronicle the Washington scene in a very fair, objective, and remarkable manner with great good humor, Lou Cannon. Th thanks very much, Alan. Uh, I met uh, Alan Simpson not then get quite a United States Senator in 1978 uh, when I was uh, the Western Bureau Chief for the Post. And uh, the po I'd been asked to do a story about uh, Dick Cheney's, uh, who had been the, the uh, uh, Chief of Staff in the Ford White House, and I knew him well, and he, about how it was to go from being Chief of Staff to uh, uh, in the White House to being a candidate for, for the House in Wyoming, which is a s small state, and the uh, House member represents the entire state. And uh, so I went over with D 
stick to this forum. And uh, he said before we went, now he said, we don't have too many rules about politics here in Wyoming. He says, but I have one rule. And he says, and that rule is I never follow Alan Simpson on the stage. <laughs> and I hadn't seen, uh, I hadn't seen uh, Alan Simpson before, but I, underst I understood why. Uh, the two uh, House candidates uh, talked and were politely applauded. And then uh, he came on the stage and he had the, he had him so much in stitches, I don't even remember if, I'm sure his opponent spoke, but I don't remember a word he said. Um, well, why are we, why are we even talking about Ronald Reagan's legacy anyway? Uh, he's, he's alive, of course. His mind isn't alive. He has this terrible mind-destroying disease of Alzheimer's. And I always raise this, and I always say this whenever I have an audience, because uh, I want people to be aware of it. There's still a stigma attached to Alzheimer's with many people. I have a friend who said to me, after Ronald Reagan wrote his letter in 1994, he said, uh, 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 you know, my mother has Alzheimer's, and she's in this institution, and he mentions the name, and I said to him, uh, Joe, I never, I never knew your mother was alive. You never mentioned her to me before. And he said, well, I think since Ronald Reagan wrote this letter, maybe I better start telling people about it. It's one of the, it's a public health crisis, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and it's uh, something that, uh, uh, that I, always, I always weave into any speech whenever I can. Anyway, Jack Germont said we're talking about Ronald Reagan's uh, legacy uh, these days because his uh, successors have made him look 10 feet tall. Uh, my oldest son, Carl Cannon, uh, the uh, National Journal, he suggests that one of the reasons that we're talking about uh, uh, Ronald Reagan, I don't know whether uh, Bill White will like this, is that uh, Clinton uh, has copied him deliberately in many ways. Uh, Mr. Clinton, whatever you can say about him, is a very smart politician, and he understood the importance uh, you have an impact if you're a two-term president. And uh, Carl wrote in a companion piece that's going to appear in George, he's, write, he's writing this for George magazine, Carl wrote that uh, uh, he learned after, st after he started covering Clinton that if you, uh, uh, Clinton didn't like to be compared to his predecessor, uh, and he really didn't like to be compared to, uh, to Jimmy Carter, but he really liked being compared to Reagan, and he did a number of things uh, in, in great and small ways. Uh, from the radio speech to the reappointment of Alan Greenspan to the 1996 uh, camp re-election campaign where the uh, Clinton people studied Reagan's tapes, they essentially ran against Bob Dole the way uh, Reagan had ran against Walter Mondale, in which uh, uh, Reagan in one case, Clinton in the other, was the candidate of the future, and their opponents were portrayed as the candidates of the past. Um, I think there's merits to these views, but I think there are intrinsic reasons that we ought to be interested in the legacy of Ronald Reagan and, and, and our, and the country is interested in him, and it's why I, basically why I updated this book that was, was written uh, uh, ten years ago. I, I, before I talk about the legacy, I want to talk just a little bit about Reagan the man, because I don't think you can, Reagan's a different kind of, kind of cat politically. Uh, he was, he was a boy who grew up in a, in a home where there wasn't very much money in Illinois, and he was a son of a, an alcoholic father, an Irish American named Jack. Uh, my father was also named Jack and had the same ancestry and the same problem, and, and Reagan and I used to talk about it. And Ronald Reagan moved a lot when he was a very little kid. They moved from town to town in Illinois. Uh, Nancy Reagan thinks the nomadic quality of, of, of his boy, early boyhood is as, as important as the alcoholism of his father. Uh, think about it. Uh, uh, ex wherever you grew up, you know, when you're a little kid, you go around and you make friends, uh, and those friends are very important to you. And if you're, if you're 
moving from town to town every year, it's, it's difficult. Uh, his friend was his brother. I've always believed, uh, I think I have some evidence of it, but, but I don't really know, that Ronald Reagan had a much, a much more vivid and interesting inner life than anybody suspected. But all of the things he did, collecting butterflies, collecting tin soldiers, uh, inspecting things along the Rock River in Illinois, all of those things were essentially things he did by himself. Uh, and, 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 he, and he read, and, and, he, and, he, was, and he was myopic. He, he, he had a hard time seeing, so although he was quite athletic, he, couldn't, he had a hard time playing in games. So there, there, he, developed a, he developed his own special character. Now, Walter Lippmann once, uh, once wrote that the uh, greatness of, of de Gaulle was not that de, that de Gaulle was in France, but that France was in de Gaulle. And I, I think that, that America, America was inside of Reagan. Uh, World War I, called the Great War then, was very, very close to the people of Illinois. There was an arch long since tor torn down over Dixon, which is where the family finally settled, in which Re Reagan and his brother uh, uh, considered their hometown, to the, to the veterans of the Great War. Uh, Reagan read a lot of stories and saw plays about that war. Uh, when he was a young man, when he graduated, when he attended this little school, Eureka College, his icon, his hero, was Franklin Roosevelt. The Reagans were a democratic family in a town of Republicans. Uh, it's very important to understand how Ronald Reagan felt about FDR uh, uh, because it determined the way he communicated. It was why he was able to communicate with the country uh, when other Republicans of his views were not because he spoke in democratic cadences and languages. He understood that the party in which I was also raised is the Democratic Party, not the Democrat Party. And, and, he, and this was part of his dialogue. Now, the family was poor. The Depression was a big, a big crushing thing to Ronald Reagan. Uh, I was told by classmates, and it's, it's valuable for a, a journalist, a historian, a writer to, to, to go back to the same subject. You know, when I said to Reagan I was going to keep writing about him until I got it right, he said, which was when I got my contract for the second book, he said, typically Reagan, he said, good line. But, uh, but I found people who remembered him as having, he, he, he would do these imitation sports accounts. He became a sportscaster. But he also learned FDR's inaugural speech, which is famous peroration, uh, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And he did that on a broomstick microphone. And, and he, he really, he really uh, kind of absorbed, he kind of absorbed FDR. And that became very important to him. Now, later Ronald Reagan, who would be uh, called an amiable dunce, and other things. Uh, it, it's, it's interesting to note that he was a success at everything he did. Uh, one of the reasons Ronald Re Reagan believed so much in the American dream is that it worked for him. He got a job uh, auditioning uh, at a radio station as a sportscaster in the midst of the, dep of the Depression when many of his classmates couldn't find work. He went to Hollywood and he took a screen test. At the time, there were a lot of people who took screen tests and were signed by studios and they never made a movie or they waited years to make a movie. He made a movie immediately and was a success. Years later, when his acting, movie acting career had all but dried up, he went into a medium that he initially despised, television, and he was the host of General Electric Theater for eight years and he had this wonderful apprenticeship, political apprenticeship, he went out and uh, talked to people all over the country as part of his contract for 10 weeks a year, worked very, very hard for GE, practiced what became known as the speech. Uh, he, he was dismissed, you know, by the Democrats in 1966 as the actor who has uh, been upstaged by a chimpanzee in bedtime for Bonzo. I asked Reagan about that years later, and he said, of course he was upstaged. He says, an animal will always upstage a human actor if the animal is any good. And, uh, and, uh, uh, 
and, and yet he won by a million votes. And Pat Brown, uh, as some of you in this audience know, uh, is not chopped liver. He was a very uh, uh, accomplished governor of California. He'd beaten Richard Nixon four years earlier. Uh, and then he, at, on his third try, he, he became president. So after a while, if you, if you uh, are looking at somebody and he keeps succeeding in different things, you have to say that something is involved beside, beside luck. And I always tried to figure Reagan out. I didn't, sometimes I did and sometimes I didn't. But when doing this book, I came upon, upon a book that was written here at Harvard by uh, a man named Howard Gardner called Frames of Mind, The Theory of Multiple Intelligences. And I talked to, to, to Mr. Gardner about Reagan and in Mr. Gardner's uh, uh, view, there are different kinds of intelligences. There are, there are not just one thing that's measured by an IQ. And Reagan ranked very high uh, in what Gardner calls interpersonal intelligence and, log and language intelligence, and low in the logical ma mathematical intelligence, which, which is the, the kind of intelligence frequently found in lawyers. These narrative stories that Reagan told to make sense of the world, he told to make sense of the word, world to himself as well as to others. He understood that was the way Reagan came to understand things. He told stories as a way of communicating. Uh, Gardner said, actors find it easier to mimic than to understand. There are kids who often have difficulty with the usual school stuff but they can parrot things back and get reinforcement from others. Many people in acting are not happy with who they are. What sets Reagan apart is that he is extraordinarily happy with himself and with the role of Reagan, which is why I call this book The Role of a Lifetime. And it was not a put down. Some of Reagan's people thought it was. He didn't. Uh, so, so what did Reagan accomplish as president and, and, and uh, why are we here? I'm going to single out a particular part of his legacy, and then I'll take questions, obviously, on anything you want to ask about it. Ronald Reagan ran in 1980 for the presidency on essentially three promises, to cut taxes, to increase military spending, which he thought was dangerously low, and which Carter, by the way, did too. Uh, after Afghanistan. The, the, Carter started increasing the military budget in the last year of his office. Reagan in, continued and vastly expanded the largest peacetime buildup in the nation's history. And then uh, uh, also to balance the budget. And Reagan essentially is uh, John Anderson, the independent candidate for president, uh, said the only way you could do all of those three things was, was with mirrors. And Reagan essentially accomplished the first two of his promises at the expense of the, of, the, of the third. I think it's probably good that he did. Uh, Reagan had a goal in mind when he ran for president. He came to the Washington Post in June of 1980, and he was talking about the arms buildup. And somebody there asked him, well, if you do this, aren't we going to accelerate the arms race, and it's going to even be more dangerous? And Reagan said, uh, I think it'd be great if we accelerated the arms race because it, it would be good for the country. It would, and he had an aide with him uh, uh, who uh, I will not, whose name I will not mention. But I, the aide was sitting next to me and I could see him visibly tense, you know, because he could see those headlines the next day. Reagan thinks arms race is wonderful. And Reagan went on to explain that the Soviet Union was economically bankrupt that the Soviets could not compete in that race with us, and they would come to the bargaining table. And for Ronald Reagan, the notion of the military buildup, it was not some mindless thing where the, the Cold War, for some people, had become sort of a, uh, uh, an end in itself. For Ronald Reagan, it was always a means to an end. It was, it, and the end was to get the Soviets to negotiate. Uh, and I, and while, while now we know how bad the Soviet Union was economically, uh, it wasn't conventional wisdom at the time. That wasn't what, what people were writing or saying at the time. 
That's where the Strategic Defense Initiative came from, and and uh, uh, what, what we call we called it Star Wars. I think it was uh, uh, Senator Kennedy who tagged it Star Wars, and uh, it's one of those derogatory words that the uh, Re Reagan Reagan himself didn't like it, but everybody embraced it on the Reagan administration. Uh, Richard Pearl, the arms control uh, a, a guy in the Pentagon, said, well, in Star Wars, the good guys won. So Star Wars, it became for everybody. Uh, Star Wars, whatever its scientific feasibility, scared the devil out of the Soviets. Not because they thought it was necessarily deployable, but because it opened the world for them in competition in too many different fields, very complex software, uh, 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 computer technology, the kinds of things that produced these, these so-called smart bombs in the, in the Gulf War and in Kosovo. Uh, they had a command and control economy. They were spending over a third. The, the Soviet specialists still argue. Some say they were spending half of their, of their uh, 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 gross product. Whatever it was, it was a massive amount. And uh, uh, so it was, it, was, it was an economic threat to them. We know now, thanks to the work, work of uh, Condoleezza Rice and Phil Zellico and others, that uh, the Soviet military's answer to the F SDI was to ask Gorbachev to give them more money. And of course, Gorbachev knew he couldn't do that. Gorbachev was trying to save the Soviet Union, reform it economically. Uh, he knew he couldn't spend more, the Soviets couldn't, had to spend less on military. So, so SDI was an important thing. It became, although Reagan always denied that that would, was what it was, a powerful bargaining chip in the negotiations. When Ronald Reagan came along, again in Condoleezza Rice's words, the Cold War was frozen in time. Uh, Reagan believed that it was necessary to engage the Soviets, and he engaged them in every different way. He engaged them famously in, in, in calling them an evil empire, which they were, and the focus of evil in the modern world. He engaged them by challenging their assumptions. He gave a speech uh, in, uh, uh, in Britain in 1982 at Westminster, where he, where he uh, parodied the famous Marxist a line about a capitalism being on the, winding up on the ash heap of history and said that was what would happen to the Soviet Union. And went on to describe in great detail the economic conditions uh, that existed in the Soviet Union. Uh, Ronald Reagan believed there was an electronic revolution going on in the world and that the Soviets, the Soviets would, would learn about it, that they would, that they would, they would somehow the, the Russian people would know what was happening. He turned out to be right. When he went to Russia, uh, the, the Russians mobbed him. I, I attended that uh, speech he gave at the university, Lenin University, and afterward, <laughs> the, 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 the students were enthusiastic about Reagan, and they knew a lot about him. And afterwards, these two Russian students are talking, and we're going out, and I don't speak Russian, but of course our Moscow correspondent did. <laughs> And he started to laugh. And I said, what's so funny, Gary? He said, uh, this one uh, student was saying to the other, boy, he really is a great communicator <laughs> in Russian. Uh, I, think, I think Margaret Hat Thatcher had it right when she said, when we attempt an overall survey of President Reagan's term of office covering events both foreign and domestic, one thing stands out. She wrote this in the final month of Reagan's second term. It is that he has achieved the most difficult of all political tasks, changing attitudes and perceptions about what is possible. From the strong fortress of his convictions, she said, he set out to enlarge freedom the world over at a time when freedom was in retreat, and he succeeded. And uh, of course, one of the reasons he succeeded was that he had Margaret Thatcher on his side. Um, so I ended this book ten years ago in a sort of uh, what I used to call the ABC ending, you know, only time will tell about the legacy. Reagan was then very popular with the country. He, he was at 63 percent in the last Gallup poll, which is the highest of any president since FDR in the departing 
poll, FDR died in office. Uh, he wasn't very popular with the experts. The experts ranked him very low among, among the uh, down in the 20s. And he's, and he's been climbing kind of ever since. Uh, in the recent C-SPAN poll, he was 11th. And, and one of the reasons he's been, but that's not unusual. Harry Truman was, was, was ranked very low by both the public and the experts when he le left office, and many people now put him among the best of presidents. Uh, was this all an accident? I mean, was, was it just an a accident that he came along when he did and Gorbachev came along when, when Gorbachev did? Um, I don't know. I think more was involved uh, than luck. And I'm going to uh, let the, as I say in the new ending to my book, let the Russians have almost the last word here. Alexander Besmertnik was the deputy foreign minister of the Soviet Union at the summits. He became briefly a foreign minister uh, after uh, Reagan. He, he was at, he sat across the table from him. This is what he said at the Princeton, at a Princeton conference on the end of the Cold War. As for common things, I would say these two men, Gorbachev and Reagan, were very idealistic. They each had their own ideals, which they tried to follow all through their lives. Their ideals were not similar but their dedication to their ideals were similar. They both believed in something. They were not just men who would trim the, their sails and go the way the wind blows. This is what they immediately sensed in each other and why they made good partners. Bess Mertnick thought it was silly when he read in the American press that Reagan could not handle negotiations. It wasn't true at all, he said. Reagan handled negotiations very, very well. He might not have known all the details, he used little cards when it came to details. He didn't like them. He didn't like the formal part of negotiations. He would try to rush through this formal part, and then he would throw away the cards and would start talking his direct way. I was across the table at all the summits and followed the presidents, followed this president for all those years, and I personally admired him very much. He was a good politician. He was a good diplomat. He was very dedicated. And if it were not for Reagan, I don't think we would have been able to reach the agreements and arms controls that we reached later because of his idealism, because he thought we really should do away with nuclear weapons. Gorbachev believed in that. Reagan believed in that. The experts didn't believe, but the leaders did. Uh, Bess Mertnick says in some other context that history is, is, is not just accident, that it, that, uh, uh, He's a Marxist, of course, but that, uh, in a very un-Marxian way, he says that, that, that history is created by, by men and women, and that, uh, and that Gorbachev and Reagan created this history together. There are other uh, legacies, as I said, political and economic. I'll be happy to discuss if you have questions about them. Uh, I think I'll, 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 I'll kind of rest here and say, uh, point out to McGregor Burns, who was no Reagan uh, aficionado, I, I uh, wrote uh, recently in the uh, Washington Post that uh, Reagan would be remembered as a great uh, or near great president. That's not the last word, of course. There's no, there's no last word in history. But I think that uh, we can safely say that the world is safer today. The world is safer today because Ronald Reagan was president. And uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Questions, please. Yes. Hi. Uh, Mr. Cannon, I want to thank you for coming. My name is Frank Mitch Kay. I'm a master's in public policy student here. I want to thank you for coming. I want to thank the forum for um, introducing some ideological diversity as they have done in the past, and I hope they keep that role up. Uh, we're not numerous, us Republicans here, but uh, my question was, uh, in reading your book and other accounts of Reagan's life, it's, it's astounding, the dichotomy. He's almost, by, by the same people, he's almost described alternatively as a, uh, a near idiot um, as far as, you know, neat relying on scripts and cards, or as a genius as far as his instinct for people and for negotiations, as you talked about. How do you resolve those two? Uh, where's the truth? And, and 
is it just a matter of what day you caught him on? Uh, I guess all of the above. Uh, uh, that's why I went to Howard Gardner. Uh, there's a problem with Reagan, and I think that, that, that what I what 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 I w w was alluding to was that he he was not the normal kind of politician. Ronald Reagan would let you ask him, but he let me ask him some of the most embarrassing questions, but he would ne never let me call him a politician, uh, even though he was a really a superb politician, of course. Uh, but he didn't think of himself as one. And he, and he didn't come to understanding the way most people do in political life through, he couldn't tell you uh, the number of uh, congressmen in your state, uh, uh, precinct work, uh, the nuts and bolts of politics he was totally uninterested in. But he paid attention. Think of his background. He's the only actor we had as president. He'd been an act, he, he, think, he paid attention to his audiences. He was the guy who picked up when the polls didn't show it that people were unhappy with what was going on in the campuses in, in, in Berkeley. And he, and he picked it up because he, he said, he'd, he'd tell his agent, I'm getting questions about this, so people must be interested in it. Some politicians who are no more than Ronald Reagan about a lot of things, fool themselves about their audiences. You couldn't fool Ronald Reagan about an audience. I remember when he gave a big speech in Washington, his governor aide rushes up to him and said, you were great. Don't give me that, said Reagan, I bombed. So he came to knowledge in a different way. And, and, and the best that I can do with that important question that you ask is this. Ronald Reagan had a very powerful but very but limited agenda. In the areas in which he focused, we know now, you know, that he was writing letters to Brezhnev and Andropov that he wasn't making public, that Al Haig, his first Secretary of State, didn't want him to write to Brezhnev, think he would be a sign of weakness. Uh, and he was doing this while he was saying harsh things about the Soviet Union. Uh, and, he, and he cared about the tax cuts, and he cared, uh, we haven't talked about that, but it's part of his legacy, uh, he, uh, about selling arms to Iran. That was his doing and his mistake. He did it over the recommendation of, of Weinberger and Schultz. It was rare those two guys would agree, you know, that today was, was uh, whatever day of the week it is. And, uh, uh, and he could be awesomely stubborn. But in areas that he didn't care about, you know, it, it's famously said, and I, of course, you have it in my book, how he, he didn't remember the name of his... Uh, Sam, Samuel Pierce, the, his HUD director, he called him Mr. Mayor. But I was very appropriate he didn't remember. He never visited HUD one day during the eight years he was, he was president. HUD wasn't on his radar screen. The stuff that wasn't on his radar screen, he, 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 that's why he could, seem, he could seem really out of it one moment and, and tuned in the next. It, 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 it depended on the subject matter. Now, I've gone on way too long and answered this question, but I just want to say, I, I think that, well, I think Ronald Reagan overdid it. You know, we had sort of presidents back to back. I used to think that Mr. Carter saying that he determined who played on the tennis courts, that that was a metaphor. And I was really shocked when I found out that he actually had done this on some occasions. And he was way too much detail. And I think you could argue, and I do argue at points in this book, that Reagan didn't pay enough attention to it. But, but I think that, in essence, in the presidency, even a person as bright as Bill Clinton can't, you can't have your, your you know, know what's going on in, in, in a lot of parts of your government. And I think you have to pick a few things if you're president and, and focus on them. And Ronald Reagan, in my judgment, focused on the most important things. Thank you. Uh, hello, Mr. Cannon. My name is CJ Mahoney, and I'm a senior at the college. You mentioned how a lot of the experts and people in the press, sort of the establishment, didn't have a very high opinion of Reagan. But at least publicly, Reagan didn't seem to be resentful of that. I mean, if you compare that to someone like President Nixon, who was, you know, always seemed to be haunted by, you know, the establishment that didn't like him and criticized him. Uh, why don't you think Reagan, do you think that Reagan was resentful in, in private of, of the opinions of some of these experts? And if, if not, why? Uh, President Reagan was self-secure. He knew who, who he was. And uh, his temper, I wrote some terrible things about Ronald Reagan, you know. I, I, I mean, I, I came back after the only leave I took writing the second book, and they wanted a story on the first inaugural. And I wrote uh, that the question was still the question when he was elected, was he up to the job? Dan Rather, not wanting to ask that question on his own, used my story to interview him. Reagan said he was shocked and dismayed. 
Well, he may have been dismayed. I don't think he was too shocked. And, and, but he, but he, he was over it the next day. I mean, that was my job. I, I was a reporter. Nixon was, poor man, you know, and it was driven by demons. I mean, Richard Nixon knew more, Richard Nixon knew more about, uh, uh, forgotten more about politics and detail than most of us w will ever know. But he, but he was driven by these personal demons. He, he, he hated and distrusted the press because he sort of basically hated and distrusted people. Reagan was basically okay with the press because he was basically okay with everybody. Thank you, sir, again very much for coming. My name is Christian Westra. I'm a junior at the college. The thing that strikes me most about Reagan is his ability uh, to communicate. And I know that's a little cliched, but in watching things like Morning in America and watching him give various sorts of speeches, it's just remarkable that he could have said some of the things he did without people being perhaps quite as cynical as they would be today if someone were to say the same sorts of things. So I wondered whether you could perhaps deconstruct Reagan's leadership uh, a bit at least, and, and explain why he was such a compelling communicator and why people were able to take a lot of what he said uh, for the truth, despite the fact that, you know, in today's political climate, things might be different. Well, Reagan himself uh, said uh, in one of his last speeches that they called me the great communicator, but I don't think, it, I don't think that was really true, that what, it was what I communicated. Uh, and I think that... Uh, Martin Anderson said recently, well, if, you had, if you'd have given Reagan another set of, of uh, if you'd have given him, uh, uh, I, I hate to use this example because I, I care so much about him, but if you'd given him George McGovern's, uh, you know, platform of 72, that it wouldn't have been convincing. But I think, I think that people are, are smarter than publishers and politicians think they are. And, and that they pay attention to substance. And now David Broder's written that the 1980 campaign was one of the most substantive in history. Reagan laid out a platform. He tried to carry much of it out. Um, I think, but I think you're right, too. I, I, I think Reagan, Reagan uh, Stu Spencer put it best. He was the guy who advised Reagan. He said, Reagan had this knack of sort of seeing things the way the guy at the bar saw them. And, and I do not know, there may be, may, and, and Alan may know of, of some, uh, because he was a very important figure in Washington during the Reagan years, but I cannot tell you of a decision, of a decision. I was just encouraging you to go on. I, 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 I cannot tell you of a decision that Ronald Reagan made as president because of a poll. I mean, Dick Worth and his pollster would come in and would say, uh, you know, only 30% of the people know who the Contras are, Mr. President, and and that was the good news because the bad news the, was that some half of the 30 percent thought they were on our side or the, the people never did figure that out they didn't care very much about it until the iran contra scandal reagan didn't want to hear it reagan didn't care Re reagan reagan's stuff came from inside him and i think people knew that and respected him even people who didn't agree with him i didn't agree with him a lot of things but but it was genuine it was he was the real mccoy thank you Hi, my name's Erin Ashwell. I'm a sophomore at the college. I'm interested to know um, where you see President Reagan's communication skills used today, uh, which candidates have picked up on that, and whether or not it's still as useful. Well, I think uh, everybody communicates a little bit differently. I, I think Reagan's was unique in that he was the product of this particular environment a path to the presidency that, you know, is nobody else has ever trod and is, is now closed. I think that John McCain showed uh, one trait of Reagan that I always thought was very, very helpful to him, which is his self-deprecating sense of humor. Now, the only person that I know who has a better self-deprecating sense of humor than Ronald Reagan is Alan Simpson. Uh, uh, but, but Ronald Reagan would make fun of himself. You know, I know hard work never killed anybody, but I figure why well, take a chance. You know, he would sign uh, uh, Marlon Fitzwater, his last and best press secretary, fell asleep on the plane, and, and they took a uh, picture of him falling asleep, and, and, he, and he wrote, Marlon, we're only supposed to do this at cabinet meetings. You know, he'd sign the picture. Reporter brings him a picture of Bonzo, you know, of a studio photo, and he signs it, I'm the one with the watch. Well, this is a guy who, people like that. 
Pe you know, I don't know, how, when I was raised, and I, and I get out of line, my father, who do you think you are, you know? You're not supposed to be too big for your britches. You're supposed to have some sense of, of, Ronald Reagan wasn't. Ronald Reagan was the same guy in the White House that he was in 65. I, I think that's, I mean, it's, it's unfair to the, to the other candidates and all the, particularly the poor Republicans who keep looking for another Reagan and they haven't come close to finding him because he ain't, I don't think he's out there. But, but McCain reminds me of, of, of Reagan with the self-deprecating sense of humor. I keep getting asked who's like Reagan. I said, well, Bush's tax plan is like Reagan's and you know, McCain's sense of humor is like Reagan, but if you add them all up, you still don't have Reagan. Uh, I think Bill Clinton is a very good communicator. I, I think that if you look at, at what, at the embarrassment of the scandal that he survived, and the, the fact that he's still even on his feet, you know, and out there, and he's out there communicating, and if you watch him at news conferences, um, uh, I think he's, a, he's, a, he's by far the best political communicator around, and uh, uh, an awful lot better than Gore or Bush. Oh, um, yes, sir. My name is Felicity Spector, and I'm a student at the Kennedy School. Um, I'm just wanting to ask you about the political legacy of Ronald Reagan, picking up on, on the point about McCain. It was surprising for me as someone coming from Britain to hear a, a candidate describing themselves as proud to be a Reagan conservative, because in Britain, although Margaret Thatcher shifted the political consensus very much to the right, and in the way the Democrats moved to the right here, the Labour Party had to do that in Britain. It's now gone the other way, and there's a huge backlash against all the values that Margaret Thatcher stood for, the sort of rampant individualism and the, and the sort of me generation is now very much discredited, and the Conservative Party has been forced to become much more moderate. Has that happened here to the, to the Republicans? Is there really, is the, the Reagan element of them being consigned to the fringe, or is there still uh, a political legacy to speak of that will continue into the 21st century? Well, I, it's complicated. Uh, let's start with California. Ronald Reagan came, defeated the last great liberal governor of, of California, and there's been no, no one since then who, I mean, uh, Jerry Brown, who became governor after, was on his, I don't say this disrespectfully to Jerry, uh, who I like, but he was on his own planet, you know, and, 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 you, and it, pretty hard to categorize. And, and the, the, the Republicans, who are in utter shambles in California, they, 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 uh, they're they better off in Massachusetts than they are in California, probably. Uh, but the Democrat, the Democratic governor there, Gray Davis, is a centrist. Ronald Reagan moved politics from the left to the center. He, he gave it a rightward tug in, in California, and he did nationally. And if you look, if you... This is provable, I think. Um, my sons count at them, uh, but, I, but, but he's better at math than I did, so I won't give you a number. But if you look at most of the proposals in Newt Gingrich's contract with America, you will find them, many of them word for word, in Ronald Reagan's 1985 State of the Union speech. The Republicans are clearly, clearly still, are still moved by Reagan. The problem, the problem is that the country has changed since, since Reagan. And, and there's no unifying element out there of the Cold War, you know, uh, uh, thanks in part to Reagan. And there is the choice issue. Now, the interesting thing about Ronald Reagan on choice, A, as governor, he signed a permissive abortion rights bill. And B, all during the years that he was president, and they'd have those rallies in Washington, Ronald Reagan was never once televised there. Uh, he, he, was all, he would address the rally by, by the uh, uh, radio or by telephone. Um, they said that was because of Mike Deaver, but Mike Deaver left the White House and Ronald Reagan continued to do that. I think that Ronald Reagan was, was, was pretty smart about a lot of things that a lot of Republicans are not, frankly, too smart about. And I think he was, the other thing he was is he was a unifier. Uh, I, I was just, the day that George Bush won the nomination, you know, he said something, or the day after, he said something negative about McCain. The day Ronald Reagan won the nomination for governor in California at a time that the moderates and the right, the conservatives were very deeply split, he called, the first call he made was to the Republican he had defeated and, and brought him on to the team. 
So I think that, that right, Reagan was a kind of, of a unifier. And I think that in the absence of having a unifier, in the absence of having a Soviet Union, and, and the fact that the Republicans uh, have a very hard time coming to terms with the choice, choice issue, I, I, I think uh, uh, the Reagan legacy is still there, but it's, 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 it's not at this moment in history a, a, a winning legacy. Hi, my name is Eric. I'm a freshman up at the college. Um, you know, a lot said about the negative effect of cable TV on kids these days. Well, I, I grew up on a farm, so I didn't have cable TV. The show I always watched was one called Family Ties. It had this character named Alex Keaton on it, and he was sort of like my idol. And uh, so I always grew up thinking, Reg Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, go, 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 you know. And the only negative thing that ever came up on my radar screen was something about the Iran-Contra scandal, but that was in the news and that was boring, so I never paid attention to it. Just wondering what the negative effect um, that the Iran-Contra scandal, Iran scandal had on President Reagan personally. I mean, Well, the, first of all, you've got to divide it. Uh, because the, the, there, there were, there, there, there's, there, there are two separate things. The Iran part of it is selling arms to Iran uh, uh, at a time that we are telling our allies that the thing that you really must not do is sell arms to Iran. We didn't sell, we didn't, we didn't bring them enough arms, send them enough arms to make any difference in that war with Iraq. Some people would say more is the pity, but, uh, but we, but in any case we didn't. Uh, but it was very important, it was, it had a, it had a very important impact on, on Reagan personally. Uh, his numbers went down, of course, but more important than the numbers, his numbers were actually a little bit lower in the 1981-82 recession, was the effect it had on Reagan. Reagan had been an actor, performer all his life. He needed to be believed. An actor needs to be trusted. He needs to be believed. And Ronald Reagan was, I thought, in the worst uh, frame of mind that I ever saw him, I don't know how, whether he could have succeeded in finishing the presidency in the months after the Iran, con this, the Iran story broke, unless he had gone and did what he did and apologized to the American people for doing it. Nancy Reagan, Stu Spencer, Bob Strauss, a lot of people were involved in that effort. Once Ronald Reagan did that, he was okay. Now, the, the, contra, the diversion to the Contras is a, I'm, I'm going to be short about it. I mean, uh, uh, um, Lawrence Wall spent seven years or six years or however long he spent on it. It was all through the Bush administration. It came out in Clinton. I, I talked to Mr. Walsh for this book, and he reached the conclusion that there's no evidence that Ronald Reagan knew of the diversion, and, uh, uh, and I certainly have none. Uh, that really, the Contra part of it turned out okay anyway. The Contras helped put pressure on Nicaragua, and you wound up with a, with a, uh, uh, this uh, democratic government in Nicaragua, but had Ronald Reagan not come to terms and faced up to what he'd done in the Iran arms sales, I don't think he could have successfully completed his presidency. Hi, I'm Tom Staley, a student in public policy here. I wondered if you could talk for a minute about the importance of Nancy Reagan in Ronald Reagan's presidency. There was. If I, I missed the I missed the, the noun. I'm sorry. I wondered if you could talk for a minute on the importance of Nancy oh, Reagan importance, yeah. in in his presidency. Well, Jimmy uh, Stewart once said that uh, if he'd have married Nancy Reagan sooner, he'd have won a, an Oscar. Uh, uh, I I think that Nancy Reagan was critical. I think she was critical, and I don't. But she was not critical in. Um, I it, it, it's it's very hard to. I think to be a first lady, and maybe uh, someday we'll get to the point in this country where we will say it's very hard to be a first man. Uh, and and every, every first lady does, goes at it a little differently. Hillary Clinton, like uh, uh, most famously Eleanor Roosevelt, is really a policy person and has obviously had a policy, policy impact, uh, as, as did, did Mrs. Roosevelt. Nancy never sought to have a policy impact, but she believed, and said so very frankly, that Ronald Reagan was gullible sometimes about people, that he thought that anybody who espoused his views necessarily was a good person, and, and uh, he, he, wasn't, he didn't have antenna. She said she did, and she was right, toward people uh, who, who were trying, who had their own agendas, 
or were trying to take advantage. The other thing she knew is that, uh, that, that Ronald Reagan, like many children of alcoholics, hate, hated disharmony. He, could, you could, uh, he didn't have any problem with a, a, an argument or discussion about different points of view, but he, he didn't like quarrels around it. And so she tried all throughout his career, she saw to it that he had a harmonious staff and a staff that looked after his needs. And, and her, uh, her reach didn't go beyond that, but, but to the, where it extended, it was, a very, it was a very powerful reach. She was very protective of him, and I think he needed that protection, and, uh, uh, and that she was crucial both to his campaigns and, and his presidency. Now she's, she's out there protecting his legacy. She's, she's, uh, she's, she's been his protector all along. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, regarding the uh, Reagan legacy me, from a conservative me, stamp, your name? Bob Chase. Uh, I didn't go to Harvard. I went to Michigan. I didn't either. Uh, <laughs> I didn't either. Um, rega regarding uh, Reagan's legacy uh, from a conservative standpoint, I would like to have your comments and your evaluation in light of the fact that Reagan uh, ran on a, a rather uh, 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 extreme conservative platform in 1980 and 1984 regarding taxes, regarding welfare, re regarding crime, uh, etc., and of course foreign policy. And I would like to know what you what you would say uh, in in light of the fact that he raised taxes three times. One in which what goes back to World War II taxation uh, rate. Uh, the crime rate went up considerably under his two administrations, and the uh, welfare rolls uh, burgeoned uh, while he was in office. What would be his, your evaluation of his legacy uh, of Reagan as a conservative uh, president? Well, I, I know of no relationship between the crime rate in the nation and anybody's presidency. I, I'm, I'm going to tell you that that doesn't seem to me to be related. But uh, he, Reagan, but, he, uh, but let, let me take let, let me deal with the uh, let me deal with the the, the, the thrust of, of of the question. Ronald Reagan was simultaneously, uh, as he is described by various people in my book, on both who are fans of his and who are not, uh, I, I, an ideologue and a pragmatist. Ronald Reagan believed that uh, you had to sort of take what you could get and come back for more. Uh, when he was governor, uh, he infuriated the extreme right wing of the legislature because he had signed this tax increase that had been crafted by the, by the uh, Democratic speaker, uh, Jess Unruh. And the notion was that Jess believed in the tax increase was needed. It, 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 it by the way, raised ta taxes on banks and insurance companies, and, which were undertaxed in California at the time. But he thought it would sink Reagan. I, I remember I asked Reagan about that a year later, and he said, "Well, he said I, uh, uh, it was the first year of my governorship, and I'm never going to have to do it again." I think he understood that a little better, the politics of that better than Jess did. I don't think that Ronald. I, I think Ronald Reagan believed in certain basic things. If you, do, if, if you look at his welfare bill in California, the bill that he, that he, that he signed, there was very little welfare reform during the Reagan years, uh, it did something that this welfare bill, uh, Clinton's welfare bill didn't do, or the Republican Congress, whichever wa wants to take uh, credit or blame for that thing. Uh, it, it raised the grants for the neediest recipients, which this, w this bill, the, 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 the Clinton bill doesn't do. So I don't think, I think Reagan was, was not an extreme conservative. I think he had conservative principles that he compromised in the margins. Um, you know, it hasn't come up here today, but a lot of the conservatives who cheer Reagan now weren't cheering him when he signed the INF Treaty. His friend Bill Buckley tried to talk him out of it. George Will called it moral disarmament. Uh, Paul Weyrich, who is a new right leader, whom I've known for years and, 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 and get along with in Washington, thought the whole thing was a plot for the Soviets to go back into Afghanistan. And I asked Paul, when, when they, he led a group of conservatives over the White House, and he says, what, uh, what did Reagan say? 
He said, we know, I know more about it than you do. <laughs> uh, it turned out he did. But I don't think that Ronald Reagan, uh, uh, I, I, if, if the thrust of the question is that his rhetoric was more conservative uh, than- uh, Especially uh, since the increased national- I, I would, I, you know, I- One question, please. Yeah. 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 Uh, um, my name is Veit Dengler. I'm an alumnus here from the Kennedy School. I'd like to follow up with a question on his social, uh, let's call it social conscience, because on the one way in your book you describe him as a very compassionate man who would send checks to people who wrote him letters. On the other hand, um, the discretionary social spending actually was cut during his presidency and poverty rates did go up. How did he as a person reconcile the two? Or did he just ignore part of his, that part of his? Well, I, I think that that Ronald Reagan believed that uh, uh, essentially the overused uh, uh, phrase attributed to, to John F. Kennedy that a rising tide lifted all boats. And I always thought that if, if Ronald Reagan had a blind spot, it was that uh, he had always succeeded himself in times of, 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 of economic calamity. And I, I don't think he realized, uh, I think that's a fair criticism of him. I don't think he realized the extent to which there were people who, who, who were unable to lift themselves up by their bootstraps. Uh, it does seem to me, however, that if you look at the uh, impact of, the monetary, of his monetary policy, that it, that it was basically helpful to the lowest quintile of, of, of Americans economically, because inflation is extremely crushing to the people who have, who have very little money and have to spend most of it on food and shelter. But, I, but I, I'm also critical of in the book, by the way, on the, on the AIDS issue. He, he finally gave a speech on it. Nancy had urged it earlier. And, and he did it because, really, his friend Rock Hudson, I think, made him aware of it. I think that he missed an opportunity there uh, he had the bully pulpit, and, and, and Ronald Reagan was, not only was he not homophobic, in 1978 he did a very courageous thing. He went uh, against the advice of his aides, spoke out against a ballot initiative that would have discriminated against teachers who were, who, were, who, were, who were gay in California. He defeated the initiative. So I always felt that with that as the background, I wanted him to say more, and, 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 and he didn't. Uh, I mean, uh, th there, there are... There are gaps in, in the Reagan legacy, as there are in all legacies. One final question, Josh, it's you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm honored. Um, thank you for coming today. Uh, you, you had some interesting quotes from Margaret Thatcher and some of the Russian leaders about Reagan and his ability to lead. And actually, I hadn't heard some of those before, but you're the expert on this, so I'll trust you. But on the other hand. Don't trust me. You can look them up. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, Thatcher and the Russian leaders had there are many quotes on the other side, too, um, not so flattering towards Reagan. Thatcher had some choice names for him at times. And the Russian leaders told stories about how he would come to the Kremlin and talk for half an hour about movies he was in instead of the issues. How do you, obviously those are contrasting views of Reagan. How do you reconcile them? They're not contrasting views of Reagan. They're, contra they're contrasting aspects of Reagan. Uh, I've talked enough, I think, to the former Soviets, and I've, I think I have read, I've read everything that Mr. Gorbachev has written that has been translated into English, and, and, and I've seen him on, the, on various television occasions, and I've you know, met, met him, and I think that on balance it's quite clear that, that Gorbachev himself, in fact, he wrote in his most recent book, he said, uh, uh, Reykjavik, you know, which we was seen as a failure at the time, it was seen as a failure in the Soviet side too. It was a symmetrical. He said, "Well, he, uh, he said he guessed maybe now people, people think a little more of Reykjavik." Uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing than they did then. And I think, uh, as far as Margaret Thatcher was concerned, uh, Reagan had had differences with Thatcher on on. Uh, he had differences with Thatcher on Grenada. He had differences with Margaret Thatcher. Like a lot of the Europeans, didn't we worried. That, we, that, that they were going to lose the American nuclear um, umbrella. Uh, but on the large question, which was the spread of freedom, the spread of democracy, the end of the Cold War, and as it turned out, the end of the Soviet Union, they were on the same side. Uh, the previous gentleman asked a question he's left, I, I noticed, 
that, that he didn't get to uh, ask, but I want to mention it, and that is the debt. He left this, the biggest change that I've made in this book in 10 years is my judgment of the Reagan deficits, which was very harsh, a very harsh judgment. He left horrendous deficits. And when I finished this book at the end of the Reagan term, I, was, I, I thought it was ironic that a guy who'd been the governor of a big state, the biggest state, and, and, and would, would, would leave this domestic leg legacy and do so much better in foreign policy. Uh, it, doesn't look, it doesn't look so, so terrible now that we have surpluses. And I have sort of adopted David Frum's view that you need to look at these deficits as wartime deficits. The United States ran huge deficits during the Civil War. It ran huge deficits during World War II. The Cold War uh, would thank God there were not a lot of casualties, but it was a very expensive war. So I think that's another way in which uh, time, time changes one's view, at least the view of this particular biographer. Thank you. I, I don't usually comment and, and I close, but I, I can't tell you how the memories flood back. Eight years I spent with the man. Uh, eight years as Bob Dole's assistant. No, no, I took the assistant uh, leader post in, in 84. So uh, for four years, I was at the White House at least three or four times a month. And it was amazing because he was an amazing man and everything you could draw pictures, you can diagram him, and it won't work. He was just, he's impossible to define. Here are two quick ones from my vast reservoir. Beautiful morning in the White House, and we were, we were mad. The Republican senators were irritated, and we went down there loaded for bear. We're going to have Jack Danforth speak for us, because Jack was an Episcopal priest, and we felt we needed all the equanimity and beauty to cover it. And, and so we, we, he told stories, and, and finally, Jack got up and he said, Mr. President, it's a beautiful morning, beautiful flowers, we've had a beautiful breakfast, sun streaming through the window, but we want to talk to you because we are very irritated about what happened. I can't even remember the issue. And you've been charming, and you've joked with us, but we want you to hear us. And he started, and Reagan just stopped him. He said, just a second, is that why you're all here? He said, did you ever hear about a phone? You ever decide to pick one up? You know where I live, what the hell, my address is right here. So what are you doing whining around like this when all you got to do is call or get on the phone or come and see me? I mean, it would just took all of it right out of the air. It was the most extraordinary thing I'd ever seen. Another time, the highway bill, and we thought, here he comes. He's bringing those three by five cards because he sure as hell doesn't know the highway bill. He walked in. He had these cards. He threw them away, and he, he drilled our teeth. He said, I won't tell you what we're going to do with iced tea and the donor states and the donee states, and here's what you're going to do, and you're going to do this, and this is what we have to have. It took about 15 minutes. Absolute quiet. I mean, these are the things about Ronald Reagan. And he wrote personal letters. I have a lot of them. Wonderful personal letters. And as he got Alzheimer's and wrote me one, he said, I have this disease. It's the most beautiful letter. And it, it tails, it comes down and tails away. But the most fun, when Nancy would go to Scottsdale to see her father, he would call personally Howell Heflin, a Democrat, Dale Bumpers, a Democrat. Gene Taylor, I think he was, was Gene a Democrat or Republican from Missouri? <laughs> it's hard to tell. And me, and we would go to the White House and tell jokes and stories all night. <laughs> I remember Heflin and I walked out of there about two one morning, hadn't covered a thing of policy, but we just laughed till our guts were aching. And Reagan said, great night, loved it. And that's the way he was. Most amazing truly amazing man, but a man of great kindness who loved his, he loved his country as much as he loved himself. There aren't a lot of people like that. Thank you. Thanks, Lou.
inside. I give this book. I think